In this video, I want to give you guys a tour of my 3D printing business. So two years ago, I came out with this 3D printed exhaust adapter part for the Glowforge laser cutter. Put it on Amazon, started selling really well. Then I came out with this six to four inch reducer for a popular fan that started selling well. And I came out with this six inch exhaust adapter for the Glowforge that started selling well also. And what started with two 3D printers uh, evolved into 14 3D printers running full time to keep up with production. But all production, I don't have any 3D printers here. These are my 3D printer graveyard back here. All production has moved out of here to other locations. So what started as a really fun and exciting journey selling 3D printed parts became overwhelming. Having to manage and keep up and pick, package, and ship all those parts was not what I wanted to be doing. So I hired two family members to run and package all the, ship, uh, package all the parts for me. And so I can do what I want to do, which is spend more time on the computer designing and coming up with new product ideas. So let's head to the first location and I'll show you my setup for how these two parts are made. And uh, let's go check it out. So this is kind of a funny time to give a tour of my business because we're in the middle of transition. Up until this point, we've printed all our parts in PLA for the last two years and it's worked great. But the summer's been really hot for a lot of states and as our parts get dropped off on someone's doorstep, that hot concrete is just baking that part. And a lot of these parts have either warped or deformed and last thing I want is a customer to get a part that doesn't fit correctly, uh, especially when they're right, waiting to get their um, low forge set up or whatnot. So we pulled all our parts off the shelf, which is a lot, which is kind of a bummer. Um, but we've been reprinting all our parts in a higher temperature plastic. We've been using PETG and that is substantially way better than PLA in terms of its heat tolerance. So that's been working really well. Uh, we may end up even moving to ABS, which will be even a little stronger, but so far the PETG has been uh, working really well and we're pretty happy with it. All right, so this is my 3D printer cabinet. So I got this cabinet at Ikea and it's been really good to house my 3D printers in. So I was able to cram six printers in this cabinet. Uh, it actually fits these Ender 3s perfectly. Um, so I like this cabinet because they fit in here really well and then I chose to go with the cabinet because I really want these uh, printers to have a climate controlled environment to print in if you 3D print you know how important that is. Um, so uh, one thing I did is I put weather stripping all around this whole thing to get it a nice uh, airtight seal. Um, and then I had this little lock that I put on the outside uh, that kind of keeps the doors pressed tight up against that weather stripping. At one time, these windows did line up with each bay when it was only four printers, but then I changed it to a, uh, a three bay, six, printer setup so they don't line up anymore but it doesn't matter. Um, Alright, well let's talk about uh, the 3D printers a little bit. Hopefully this door stays open. Um, if you're familiar with Ender 3s you'll know this is a really stock setup. I really don't do many modifications at all. There's a lot of modifications out there to improve print quality but where I choose to spend most of my time is in the slicer settings. Uh, this particular part, this reducer, I've liter literally spent over a hundred hours in the slicer settings fine-tuning test printing over and over to not only uh, reduce time in the print but to get the most uh, high quality print and I don't know if you can see that too well but that's coming out pretty dang good but that's what I do I don't really do all these little uh, uh, tricks and mods I spend just countless hours in the slicer settings and printing the same part over and over I have the luxury to fine-tune that process obviously if you're running services and each part you get is different obviously don't have that luxury. Um, probably the biggest thing I did is I moved the extruder from the left side and I moved it to the center. Uh, one thing I was having an issue with is when my spool was turned this way the filament would come in it would take this really sharp turn in and sometimes the filament would snap so I moved it over I laser cut an acrylic plate uh, right here to mount it and this way the filament just comes straight from the roll right into the extruder. So that works really well. I did these little uh, fan shrouds to prevent 3D printing hairs from getting sucked into the fan. I was having to clean those pretty regularly. 
so I did that. Um, you can see that each... Ah, that's funny, this one's not labeled. Here, let's go down to this one. That one's labeled D, that one's labeled C, and so I have all the, all the printers labeled. We got E. That one's typically F, but I moved A and F recently. But so typically, it would be A, B, C, D, E, F. And uh, that way, uh, Sherry, my contractor, she can shoot me a text, say, hey, printer A has been having issues, and then we can address it. That way I know which printer is having the issues or whatnot. Uh, I run blue tape. Um, I love blue tape, especially blue tape that's about three months old. Uh, brand new blue tape doesn't work that great for me. Uh, just really used tape that's been printed on a couple hundred times. I absolutely love it. It works out. This has worked really well for PETG. I said that we might be switching to ABS. We're probably going to have to switch to maybe a glass bed uh, with ABS, but it's been working out really well so far. Um, I think that's about it. We've, I'll say probably the biggest problem we've had is power loss issues. Uh, not power loss to this house. Um, power's fine. I would just get these random weird issues of one would just stop and it would say power loss and like the power's on there is no power loss or one would just randomly stop mid print or a layer line would shift really just weird stuff one guy i found online he said ghost in the machine that's kind of what it feels like there's a ghost in the machine sometimes so um that's been kind of weird um i am running on a 20 amp outlet which should be sufficient for six 3d printers so I just recently purchased a power conditioner, which is supposed to be like a water filter for your power. So to get rid of some of the frequencies that might be screwing with some of these printers. But other than that, they've been, they've been working pretty well. So typically the process from here is we would grab these parts and it would normally be sticking to the bed, but I already broke them off. So I knew I was shooting a video. So we'd grab the parts, we'd set them over here. Um, if they just came off of the printer, I would let them cool for a while. Um, this is the fan that they go on to, but I don't want to test fit them when these are warm, because I'm going to get uh, an inconsistent reading. So if these are warm, I'll let them sit, and we'll go back to the 3D printers, reset those, get those going again. After these have settled to room temperature, uh, we do hand test, hand uh, check the fit on every single one of these. So we'd grab one. This is the part that it sits on uh, in real life. So we'll test fit every single one of them. That's a nice tight fit. Put that down. You can see I got these uh, PVC pipes labeled A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, so we just go through every single one, test fit it, make sure it's a nice tight fit, and then put it in its respective PVC pipe. Um, the reason why we separate that way is because even though these printers are the same, printing the exact same G-code, each part comes out a little differently. One will be a little more shiny, another part might be a little more of a matte finish, so it's, it's really interesting how that works. And I don't want a customer, usually people order these in two packs, I don't want a customer getting one that's a little flat and one that's a little shiny. So we make sure to ship two parts that came from the same printer. And this is kind of how we keep these organized. Um, so that's kind of the process, test fitting them. And then when we get a big sleeve that's ready to go, she'll just grab these, walk over to the uh, packaging area, and then start to uh, kind of inspect, clean up some of the hairs, and then package them too. So here, we'll also not only check the fitments, but also kind of do like a little once over to make sure nothing weird happened, there's no wall separation and whatnot. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Um, I got four more 3D printers over here in another cabinet. We'll walk through here. It's kind of tight, so hopefully you can see it. So not a whole lot going on right here right now. So all these are um, over there on the packaging uh, table. All the parts have been taken off, but I'll show you kind of how this works. Same setup. Um, I try to keep things very consistent. Um, as I can through all these printer cabinets. So we take the part off and we test fit it. This is a piece of aluminum that I got machined at a local machine shop. So this is the exact size of the part that this actually slides onto. So we do our test fit here. That's a nice tight fit. 
and go through and hand test fit every single one of these. That's a nice tight fit. And so same process. After we test fit the part and we get a big stack of it, then we carry the stack over to the packaging area. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But I've been really liking these cabinets so far. Um, I really like that it's nice and temperature controlled. The beds are at 60 degrees, and so that generates, or 60 uh, Celsius, so that kicks off a nice, um, keeps a nice warm environment in there, and that weather stripping kind of helps keep all the heat locked in there. Um, if we switch to ABS, which I think we might, we might switch to kind of these individual zipper um, enclosures, but we'll see. So here we got uh, a whole array of parts that are ready to be inspected. Uh, wipe down, sanding if, if necessary, and then they'd be uh, packaged up. Um, so there we do all the test fitting, and here there's little hairs that get on the parts as you know if you 3D print, and so we'd get a cloth, wipe them down, maybe a little sandpaper, hit them up, make sure there's no defects, there's no hairs. Um, it's very important to me that a, a customer gets a nice high quality part. If they're paying their money for it, I want them to get a nice perfect high quality part. So we inspect these pretty rigor rigorously. I can't tell you how many of these we've trashed. Um, if there's one little defect on it, we'll toss it. So I want the customer to get a nice uh, quality part. So we'll inspect them here. Um, we'll just throw them in a poly bag, uh, wrap a few coats of bubble wrap around, throw it in a box, get the, the tape. If you guys are looking for a awesome tape dispenser, U-Line is the way to go. Uh, hit the box, and then we'd ship all these boxes. We'd put them all in a larger box that would then go uh, to Amazon. So obviously over here too, a uh, little insert we throw in there, product labels, slap the product label on the box, uh, ship it off to Amazon. So that takes care of it for this, uh, this location, this facility, whatever you want to call it. Um, but let's head over to the next location uh, where I print that exhaust adapter part and I'll show you how that one works. So one of the most difficult things for me on this journey has been delegation. Um, I really needed to delegate and outsource um, as much as I could because it was just getting too much for me to handle. But it's my baby. I've, I've created it, I've been with it from the beginning, no one knows it better than me, right? And so it's really hard to let go of that and entrust it to someone who hasn't been there the whole way and the people I hired do not have 3D printing experience. So the problem that I had to solve was how do I create a system? How do I create uh, a 3D printing system that is set up so well and so streamlined that I can just pass it on to anyone and they'd be able to pick it up, they would know what to look for, they would know how to test fit the parts, how to inspect them, and how to package them properly. And so I spent probably a good month uh, designing workflow, getting everything as efficient and streamlined as possibly could, and to kind of foolproof uh, the system so that when I pass it off to someone, I would have a little bit more confidence that they're going to be successful. All right, well, we're here at the final location where this part is made. This is the original part that I started printing with. Um, so I'll show you the cabinet for this one. Again, same setup as the ones you saw before. Um, same IKEA cabinet. This is actually two individual cabinets that I put together. Um, at one time I had six printers in here, but right now four is enough to keep up with production. I had to take two out to help with the reducers because those take a lot longer to print. Um, but again, same setup. We uh, actually just recently moved this part to ABS. We were printing in PETG, but they were coming out uh, really stringy. So uh, we tried ABS and it's a lot less stringy. Uh, so that's been great. I don't want the people I hired to have to do a bunch of sanding and waste time doing that. Uh, we did have to ditch the blue tape for the bed and we moved to uh, just some adhesive bed that we have to lay down on top. That's been working well. I'll show you a little bit of the, the process or the workflow for how these work. So typically, um, again, like the other one, the reducers, we'd take them all off, kind of stack them here at a stage. And then uh, once they cool down to room temperature, then we'd take our part. Again, we have the same uh, part that we machined uh, from a machine shop to the exact diameter of the Glowforge. So we just put our part on, uh, okay, just to uh, test fit it, make sure it fits okay. Then after that, 
Um, if it needs any uh, sanding, any sharp edges or stringing, hit it down here. Um, maybe a quick wipe down on here. And then typically we'd have bags in here. We'd bag it up, uh, throw a little label on there. And then we have this box here. So this, this cart is specifically designed for uh, printing this part. Um, I designed it specifically for this workflow. The other reducer cart that I showed you, that's specifically designed for the reducer workflow. So after we get this bagged up and labeled, then we drop it in the box. You can see I got a bunch of parts in there ready to go. And so we uh, drop one in and then we'd hit our little ticker counter. That way we know how many parts are in there and we don't have to recount our parts. And then that way my contractor knows uh, how many parts um, they're giving me when they drop them off. And then I can uh, give that same number off to Amazon uh, to let them know how many is coming in our inventory. Um, I will say uh, sh uh, shipping these or selling these on Amazon has been uh, amazing as opposed to uh, selling them on Etsy. Um, at first selling on Etsy was super fun at first to uh, start and it was really exciting, but then having to drive to the post office every day and drop off parts was overwhelming. So now we just take a big batch, a box of 100 or so, ship it to Amazon, and each time someone places an order it ships from Amazon, not me. Um, that way I don't have to run to the post office every day, so that's nice. Uh, so um, I think maybe some uh, final thoughts or recommendations if you are uh, starting a print farm or if you have one. Um, one, keep some spark spare parts on hand. Uh, you never know when something's gonna uh, go bad or go wrong on your printers and it might happen to all your printers at the same time and, um, and you wanna minimize downtime. So have some spare parts on hand. Uh, I have some spare filament on hand. I try to have about two weeks of filament on hand. Right now I've been switching back and forth, so I'm not really, I've been playing with my different brand or the type. So now that this white ABS is good, I'm probably gonna stock up a couple weeks worth. So last year, 2020, we were printing fine, everything was great, and then COVID happened and I couldn't get my filament for three weeks. So now I try to keep a little on hand in case something happens. Um, I would highly recommend um, not skimping on your brand of filaments. Um, I personally feel like it's way better to spend a little extra on a good quality filament. Um, I started with cheap filament. You gotta start with cheap filament to make money at first, that makes sense. Um, but then I've returned so many uh, just brittle rolls of filament and looking back all the time and money I wasted buying filament, having to return it, just get a good quality filament that you like and you're happy with. Um, so there's, there's some uh, recommendations off the cuff. One last thing I would say is number your printers. Um, I So I have a name, again these are named the same A, B, C, D. A name is fine but I would also put a number somewhere else. Write a sharpie on your power supply, get a little label maker or something. So my, my numbering system was the letters. I did like A through M at first but then I took A through D and delegated those to extensions and I took the other ones and delegated those to reducers and named those A through D and then took another group and labeled those or named those A through D and now I don't know who the original A is and if one of my contractors say hey there's an issue with A I'm like okay is that is that the very first printer I got or is that like the eighth printer I got and so I wish I would have numbered the printers that way I know okay this is the first or second printer I ever bought it's the oldest one I have maybe I should just replace it or do a complete overhaul so I'd recommend doing that. Um, overall, uh, this has been kind of a crazy wild journey. It's been uh, fun. I would say that hiring people has absolutely saved my sanity. Uh, last year in 2020, we sold a total of 3,000 parts, 2850 to be exact. And then this year, 2021, we'll probably s uh, sell about 5,000 parts. And that doesn't include all the parts that we printed that maybe didn't fit right or came out bad. So. That's a lot of parts and hiring people to keep up with production uh, has just been uh, a lifesaver, both to, for me to get my time back and spend my time coming up with new product ideas and then also just to keep my sanity. Uh, these days I try to uh, spend my time working on new product ideas and I'm also kind of a 3D printer maintenance technician so I'll drive over here, do some maintenance, things like that. That's not always the funnest thing to do. Uh, but it has been really rewarding. Uh, to be able to hire other people and pay them, be a source of income for someone else. Um, 
So that's been really sweet and their family members too, so it's, it's kind of cool. So I hope this video was a help to you guys. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for, for me or whatnot, uh, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Let me know. And I'll catch you guys in the next video.